I need 15 vials of the South African polyvalent. Lawrence, South Carolina, Independence Day. A young man called Teddy Tarrant was bitten by his pet. That pet happened to be an Asiatic spitting cobra, one of the deadliest snakes in the world. In Miami, the call came at 8 p.m. Al Cruz and Ernie Gilson knew it was serious. What a nightmare that call was. How are we going to get the serum to him on a holiday evening when there's no flights left? Carolina? In Asia, the spitting cobra causes thousands of fatalities a year. Its venom can kill a man in two hours. Teddy was in a South Carolina hospital. The anti-venine was 700 miles away in Miami. By 10 p.m., Teddy was struggling for breath and having convulsions. To complicate matters, Teddy's wife Ashley was nine months pregnant and fearing the worst. I didn't know if there would be enough time because it was right there, you know, he was, he started shutting, you know, he couldn't breathe. I just, I just didn't think it was going to be okay. Time was of the essence. Teddy was critical. We knew that he was going to deteriorate, and we knew that if we didn't get help to him, that he wasn't going to survive. Okay. Just after midnight, Teddy stopped breathing, but still no plane to get him to Miami. 12.45 a.m., the air ambulance was ready. By the time Teddy's plane landed at Miami International, he was clinically dead. If you want to have a Benadryl, go ahead and mark the time, please. Dr. Robert Del Cristo began administering the antivenine. When he got here, he was totally paralyzed. Uh, he was intubated. He was uh, basically needing all sorts of support, IV therapy, uh, all that. We gave him five vials of syrup, no response at all. Gave him another five vials, and that's when we saw the first sign of life. Can you move your feet? Four o'clock in the morning, totally paralyzed. Ten o'clock in the morning, this gentleman was breathing by himself in the intensive care unit. Well, that's an amazing story. And it's a good reminder of two things. Number one, how absolutely precious life is. And number two, how incredibly fragile it is. You know, sometimes I think in the hubbub of everyday life, we can tend to lose sight of those things. And I suppose that's only human nature, to focus on the things that are right in front of us at the time, and to tend to ignore the bigger picture. But that's really the purpose of this program, to step back and to reset our focus. It's a good thing to set aside our daily routines once in a while, and to step off the treadmill of life, and step out of the rat race of life and simply focus on the bigger picture. Because let's face it, life is uncertain. Nine fifty-nine. as the Pentagon burns, the south tower of the World Trade Center buckles and collapses. Ten twenty-nine. the second Trade Center tower collapses. An American landmark is in ruins. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. Thousands feared dead, lower Manhattan shrouded in smoke and debris. And so as a, a catalyst, if you will, to help spark this realigning of our priorities, I have a question for you. What happens to you when you die? Have you ever thought about that? Well, of course you have. We all have. Perhaps in light of recent events, more than ever before. I know, for example, when people fly on planes these days, they certainly think about it more. Now, the truth is, it's an inevitable fact of life. The statistics never change. Ten out of ten people die. So what do you think happens when we die? I suppose we all have opinions about that subject, don't we? But let me ask you a perhaps more important question. Where did you get your opinion? Can you trust it? I mean, this isn't an opinion about a movie or a restaurant or, 
or how you should cut your hair, because this opinion could, and in fact actually does, have eternal ramifications. So what you're thinking here? Well, to give you an idea of what other people are thinking, here's a sampling of the kinds of answers people typically give on this subject. If you were to die tonight, where would you go and why? I think I would go to heaven because while I'm here, I've done well. I mean, I, I don't take people for granted. I don't do harm. I really believe that there's a place for, for good people to go. So I think I'll go to heaven. I, I don't believe in the heaven and hell thing. You know, I just I believe that uh, there's a place for all of us with God, and I don't... Uh, I don't think there's any, any judgment and some of us are going to get cast into hell and some of us are going to go to heaven and that kind of stuff. But I, I believe everybody and all the creation will be together. Well, Jesus Christ, I mean, he's our Lord and the Savior. He's down on the cross. He's like the Lamb of God. It's like, it's like he came down from Calvary so that we could be for missing from our sins and everything and that he could behold our lives and everything, that we may have a new new uh, new birth in him. Because the Bible says all things are past, but behold, all things become new again. Where would I go? I don't know. I just might be a little, you know, uh, who knows? I, I don't know that answer. You can't ask me that. I don't know. If I were to die tonight, probably heaven, I think. If you were to die tonight, where would you go? Into my next life. Just um, get the most you can out of this life on a spiritual level so that when you come back in your next life, you can teach the rest of the people how to get there. They're depending on each other, each other, karma, virtues, non-virtues, they're depending. Even if you want to go pure land, you do dharma, spiritual, not material. If you're going to die tonight, where would you go? Right underneath the ground. If you were to die tonight, where do you believe you'd go? I don't know. I don't know where I'm going to go. <laughs> go figure. There were literally as many answers as there were people. Well, that doesn't help very much, does it? So, what else could we do here? Well, I have an idea. We could find out which one of those answers could be definitively proven out of the other ones. We could seek to find out which answers are mere blind speculation and rule them out and then rule in the only correct answer. And we could then just trust that one, the one that could be definitively proven. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, you mean such a thing is possible? I, I thought this was a matter of faith or personal opinion or religion or something. Well, let me tell you something. For every single person who has eyes to see and who has ears to hear, I am going to present to you hard, cold facts about a single event that has taken place in human history that once it's been proven will definitively give you the answer to this supposed quandary of life and death. And I call it a supposed quandary because it's an outright myth to suggest that it is impossible to know with certainty what happens when we leave this life and what decisions we must make in order to affect the best possible outcome for ourselves in the next life. It's a deception, a, a lie, and you'll find out why in this program.
speculation and religious mumbo jumbo. But you're going to have to leave your prejudgments and prejudices behind. So here's the first order of business. I need to establish with certainty that what I'm going to tell you is not merely my personal opinion or, or my quote unquote religion. In fact, in order for you to accept what I have to say, I'm going to need to do a lot more than just that. So I'm going to have to establish with certainty that my information is 100% trustworthy and reliable. So here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt using empirical, measurable, reliable, and very verifiable evidence that the most spoken about, written about, and followed man in the world, Jesus of Nazareth, rose from the dead. If you think that makes this merely a, a religious program, well, you're sadly mistaken because this is no more or less than life itself. This is practical, vital, where the rubber meets the road kind of information that affects all of us, no matter what religion we are, no matter what viewpoints we presently hold. Because I think you'll find it hard to argue against this self-evident truth. If, if Jesus Christ actually did physically rise from the dead three days after he died on that cross, and if that event was not a religious myth made up by and believed by a bunch of well-meaning but bewildered and very naive people, well then even the biggest skeptic would have to concede that single event would validate the claims of Jesus Christ. And it would validate what he and his disciples and millions and millions of people have held fast to as absolute truth for over 2,000 years. Namely, that Jesus Christ is not merely human, but he is divine and therefore his claims to be the single definitive source of the single correct path to heaven are also true. So the logic is simple and it's sound. If Jesus of Nazareth really did raise from the dead, then he is God, just like he claimed to be. And therefore, if he is God, well then we better pay very, very close attention to what he said because it is impossible for God to lie. And I think it's fair to say, only the most hardened cynic would deny that logical reality. And I'll tell you something else. Amidst this hodgepodge of secular humanism and New Age philosophies and man-made religions that exist in our current culture today, coupled with this very bizarre habit that Americans tend to have of making personal opinions on an even par with truth and reality, our modern culture has lost touch with a very simple truth. Christ's resurrection can be proven. It can be empirically documented with as much certainty as any universally believed and well-documented event in ancient history. In fact, more so. And to prove it, by the way, we won't need to presuppose a single thing that people might consider to be controversial. In other words, it won't be necessary to presuppose that miracles can happen, or that the Bible is infallible, or even that the Bible's divinely inspired by God, or even that the Bible's necessarily true. Nor will we need to presuppose that there was really an empty tomb, or that Jesus appeared to people after his resurrection, or or anything else that some people find to be stumbling blocks to accepting this truth. In fact, we're only going to need to presuppose two things, both of which are hard facts from empirical data. Empirical data that essentially no one denies. Namely, number one, that the New Testament texts that we have today are accurate. That what we read today as the Bible was in fact written that way 2,000 years ago. And virtually no one even denies that today. The textual confirmation of that in light of modern scientific and archaeological finds has been overwhelming in recent years. Now, in comparing with secular literature, for example, Caesar and the Gallic Wars, 
10 manuscripts. But nobody in the university questions that Caesar fought the Gallic Wars, and for a long time, he was the only one that ever survived that wrote about it. A thousand years, the closest manuscript after he died, and there's only 10 manuscripts. Of Plato, seven manuscripts. Of Tacitus, the uh, Roman historian, Right now, there's less than 20 manuscripts that have ever survived. And then Thucydides, many people consider Thucydides one of the most accurate historians of antiquity. And yet, there's only seven manuscripts. And those are 1,300 years after Thucydides died. Herodotus is eight manuscripts in about 1,400 years. With um, Pliny the Younger, there's about seven manuscripts. With Sophocles, 193, which is one of the most. Euripides, 9. But men and women, Aristotle, there were 13. Now it's up to 49 they've discovered. Well, with the New Testament, just the New Testament, in the new evidence that demands a verdict, I have now been able to document 24,633 manuscripts of just the New Testament. I never even knew they existed until I set out to make a joke of it. And later, I found out the joke was on me. I had not done my homework. And the second thing that we need to presuppose is that Christianity actually exists today. Not that it's necessarily true, just that it exists. That's it. Those are the only two things that we need to presuppose. Which means I'm going to make this as easy and straightforward as I can for even the most hardened sinner. So let's walk through the evidence together, one step at a time. You know, this isn't rocket science, but neither is it blind faith. So what I'm going to do is both simple enough for anyone to check for themselves and it's factual enough to remove any doubt of any reasonable person. Ready? Here's the premise. When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when it comes to the question what really happened in Jerusalem on that first Easter Sunday over 2,000 years ago, there are only five theories that are even possible because the facts that we do know with certainty limit the possible options down to only five. And those five theories are as follows. Theory number one, some people say that the whole event of the resurrection never actually occurred at all because it was merely a hallucination that the disciples thought they saw what in fact never actually occurred. So the theory goes, the apostles were mistaken. They were self-deceived. Theory number two, others say that the whole event never occurred because it was only a myth, a story fabricated by the disciples. And the idea behind this theory is that good men made up an event that was never really meant to be taken quite so literally in the first place. Theory number three, still others say the whole event never occurred because it was instead really a conspiracy conspiracy that was developed and carried out by the disciples of Jesus. And the idea behind this theory is that Jesus' disciples got together and, and purposely created the story of the resurrection, which of course would make them all out to be liars and deceivers. And then there's theory number four, the swoon theory, which sets forth the idea that Jesus never actually died, that he was merely unconscious for a time. And then his return to consciousness was mistaken for a bona fide death to life resurrection. And of course, there's theory number five, the Christian explanation, based on the recorded events of the Bible, that Jesus Christ resurrected, literally and physically, from the dead, because he is a loving God who sacrificially died for the sins of his people. That's it. Other than that, other than those five possibilities, you're left with either logical sounding arguments that upon closer review don't even remotely match up with the facts of what we do know, or perhaps a few wacky fringe far out explanations that responsible historians have with good and obvious reasons never taken seriously. 
explanations like Jesus was really a Martian from another planet, that he never really existed at all because the whole Bible was made up as a fantasy novel by a group of simple fishermen, which frankly really would be a miracle. Well, anyway, the point is, if you're willing to be intellectually and morally honest with yourself, all of the five theories are, in fact, logical possibilities. And so, all five should be given their just day in court. Each one should be fairly investigated and seriously considered. And by the way, that includes fairly investigating and seriously considering theory number five, Christianity. You can't rule it out just because you have a pre-existing bias against it or because you're comfortable with your own religion. So we're going to look at all five, and here's the reality of the situation. If four of the five theories can be utterly and totally refuted, and the fifth possibility can be confirmed, and there are no other logical or practical possibilities, well, and the obvious conclusion that we're left with is the fifth alternative must clearly be the truth. Well, I told you this wasn't going to be rocket science, nor blind faith. This is going to be a, a simple, verifiable, and very factual look at a historical event that has intense ramifications for all of us. So let's do that right now. Let's look at the facts. And as we do, I think you'll realize that most people have fallen into the trap that because the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened over 2,000 years ago and is therefore not directly observable, that that somehow rules out the possibility of using empirical evidence to prove or disprove the case. Well, some of you are going to be surprised to find out it doesn't. The fact that we can't visibly observe the resurrection does not mean we can't use empirical data, hard facts, to confirm it. Because we're going to use data and hard facts that are directly observable to plainly show that there is only one possible conclusion that any of us can draw from that hard data. So I'm going to walk you through each theory one at a time. And I'm going to do it in this order. I'm first going to take you from the simplest, least popular, and most easily refuted to the most confusing and most popular and most complexly refuted. So the order will be the swoon theory, the conspiracy theory, the hallucination theory, and then finally the myth theory. dictionary it means a partial or total loss of consciousness a state of suspended animation so the idea behind the swoon theory that some people like to use in order to support their claim that the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead never actually occurred is the contention that Jesus must have passed out from the intense pain of the crucifixion Maybe he even lost vital signs for a period of time. And then, three days later, when he regained consciousness in theory, he revived and came out of the tomb. And those events led to the story of the resurrection. Great concept. My problem is it holds absolutely no water whatsoever. In fact, there are at least eight reasons why the swoon theory cannot possibly be true. Reason number one, plain and simple, Jesus could not have survived the crucifixion. Roman procedures were very careful to eliminate that possibility. In fact, the crucifixion was so brutal, so public, and so complete that death was a 100% certainty. In fact, at the time Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, there was such a preoccupation with making sure that all of the prisoners who were crucified actually died, that Roman law even laid the death penalty on any soldier who let a prisoner escape in any way. So the point is, it never happened. No one was ever crucified and survived, ever. 
So you can forget that possibility. But let me give you just a handful of other reasons why the swoon theory is complete fantasy. Reason number two, the fact that the Roman soldier did not break Jesus' legs as he did the other two crucified criminals means that the soldier was certain that Jesus was already dead. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Breaking the legs of the men crucified was one way that soldiers more or less moved up the timetable of the death of the criminals. Because when the criminals' legs were broken, it prevented them from pushing up on the sedile with their feet in order to catch another breath. And since the soldiers knew Jesus was already dead, in his case, that was unnecessary. Death in crucifixion was hastened by the breaking of the legs of the victim. This procedure, called crura fracture, prevented the ability of the victim to take in a good breath. Death would occur quickly from suffocation. In Jesus' case, he died quickly and did not have his legs broken, which, through no coincidence, fulfills one of the prophetic requirements of the Passover lamb, that not a bone shall be broken. To confirm that the victim was dead, the Romans inflicted a spear wound through the right side of the heart. When pierced, the sudden flow of blood and water came from Jesus' body. Reason number three. John, an eyewitness, certified that he saw blood and water come down from Jesus' pierced side after a soldier stabbed him with a spear. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. Reason number four, the body itself was completely encased in, in winding sheets and entombed. So to breathe would have been literally impossible even if Jesus had somehow miraculously survived the crucifixion. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Reason number five, think about this one. After Jesus resurrected and appeared to his disciples, they were transformed from quivering cowards to bold defenders of the truth, who eventually were willing to die for what they had seen. After the resurrection, Thomas even worshiped Jesus as God. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, 
and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And if the contention is that the only thing that these newly inspired disciples had seen was a badly injured Jesus who struggled out of the tomb after reviving from a swoon, well, let's just say a half-dead, staggering sick man who had just narrowly escaped death from being crucified as a fraud, is hardly worth worshiping as Almighty God and the conqueror of life and death. Reason number six. How exactly were the Roman guards? A full guard of 16 soldiers that were the military equivalent of the Green Beret. How is it they were overpowered by a swooning corpse or by a group of ragtag disciples? And anyway, if the disciples did do it, that would put us into the conspiracy theory category, which we'll refute in a couple of minutes from now. Reason number seven, how could a, a swooning half-dead man move the 2,000-pound the boulder that blocked the tomb, much less do it from the inside? And keep in mind, those Green Beret Roman soldiers were on the outside, 16 of them, and they were commissioned with guarding that tomb under the penalty of death. In other words, if even one of them fell asleep, much less all 16 of them, all 16 would have been executed. Let's just say it's not very likely. Reason number eight, if Jesus did wake up from a swoon, where exactly did he go? I mean, this was one of the most well-known and controversial figures of his time that was now supposedly walking the streets of Jerusalem. And everyone, friends and enemies alike, would have been searching for him. Now, of course, the scriptural record records that he ascended into heaven as God. But if he didn't, and he swooned, well, then where did he go? The truth is, there is absolutely not a single claim. No data, not even false or imagined stories. Nothing about Jesus' life, or for that matter, even about his corpse after that eventful day that would indicate anything like a swoon resuscitation occurred. And a man like that, with a history like that, surely would have left some traces. So where did he go? By the way, you may be ready to claim I cheated here a little bit by violating my original promise not to presuppose the truth of Scripture, since I've obviously argued the facts from data that comes from the biblical texts themselves. Perhaps you've forgotten something. The people that argue the swoon theory don't actually challenge the truth that is found in the text that I referred to. They only challenge the ones that state that Jesus resurrected from the dead, bodily and physically. So I'm only arguing from the very same premises that the critics themselves use, which anyway is information that no one argues isn't true, because as I stated earlier, the archaeological and historical evidence that has been unearthed in recent years has virtually silenced the critics. And while there will always be naysayers, anyone who has actually looked into the text for themselves has found that the textual integrity of Scripture is factual and historical. It's accurate to A.T. I think the bottom line is clear. The swoon theory only takes on a life of its own when people haven't bothered to check the facts. I know, maybe the disciples made up the whole resurrection story. 
That's feasible, isn't it? Not a chance. Not in a, a million years. Why? Well, a bunch of reasons, frankly. But let me just give you seven to whet your appetite. Reason number one, the well-known philosopher Pascal gives a nice, simple, psychologically sound proof for why the conspiracy theory is unthinkable. The hypothesis that the apostles were evildoers is quite absurd. Follow it out to the end and imagine these 12 men meeting after Jesus' death and conspiring to say that he had risen from the dead, despite the fact that in order to do so, they would have to take on the attacks of virtually everyone, civil authorities, religious authorities, cynics, critics, and friends alike. And to believe this, you would have to discount the fact that the human heart is singularly susceptible to fickleness, to change, to promises, to bribery. One of them had only to deny his story under these inducements or still more because of possible imprisonment, tortures, and death, and they would have all been lost. Follow that out and you quickly realize it's an absurd proposition to suggest the disciples were embroiled in a conspiracy. The real cruncher in Pascal's argument is the historical fact that no one, weak or strong, sinner or saint, heretic or Christian, ever confessed freely or under pressure or bribe or even torture that the event of the resurrection was a fake, a lie, a deliberate deception. Never. Even when people broke under torture, denied Christ, and worshipped Caesar, they never let that cat out of the bag. They never revealed that there was some sort of big conspiracy taking place because that cat was never in the bag. No follower of Jesus Christ ever believed the resurrection was a conspiracy. And if they had, they never would have become followers of Christ in the first place. Reason number two, if they, the disciples, had made up this whole story, including the resurrection, well, then what we would have to believe is this. We'd have to believe that a, a group of completely uneducated, inarticulate fishermen created the single most enduring book ever written in an eloquent and in a literary style and profoundness that surpasses Shakespeare, Dante, and Tolkien combined, all without the help of the supernatural intervention and divine inspiration of God. In other words, I don't think so. Reason number three, the record clearly shows these were good, simple, highly moral, honest men. There's nothing in their lives that even hints at the fact that they were somehow cunning, conniving liars. In fact, they weren't even lawyers. No offense intended to the legal profession. And think about what these otherwise simple men wrote. Their letters have actually been compiled into the Bible as a book that has staggered some of the most brilliant and moral minds and lives in history. And they not only wrote about and preached about a resurrected Christ, they lived their lives in his resurrection power. So ask yourself, if you dare, how is it that men who were common sinners became the morally elite of their day virtually overnight? And nothing proves sincerity like martyrdom. So you also have to ask yourself, how is it that every single one of these disciples of Jesus, who before the event of the claimed resurrection were running and scattering to protect their own skins, and then afterwards, they each became martyrs for the cause. They each, every last one of them, willingly died brutal, painful and very otherwise avoidable deaths for what they believed in. And I know what the objection is when some people hear that. They point to the recent September 11th events or events like those. And they point to religious fundamentalists dying for what they sincerely believed in. But I encourage you to go and read the accounts of such wicked men, so-called martyrdom. And you will find, virtually without exception, that such men who die for false religions are men who have led wicked lives that betray their claims of relationship with God. In fact, 
less than 24 hours before several of those terrorists boarded the aircraft that they intended to fly into the World Trade Center, many of those men were spending their final night breaking their own religious creeds by drinking and carousing in strip clubs. So it always is, because what is inside a man eventually comes spilling out. And what was inside of those disciples of Jesus who gave their lives for what they knew to be true? Well, it was moral purity to the highest degree because their lives showed it in word and in deed. And I want you to use your minds and your sense of perspective here. Imagine 12 poor, fearful, not particularly sharp peasants literally turning the entire civilized Roman world upside down with a supposed lie, a lie that they allegedly knew was untrue, and a lie that was not a very easily digested or attractive lie at that. I mean, if you're going to pick a lie that you, you know is going to cost you your freedom and your social acceptance and eventually your life, one would think that you would pick a lie that was more personally beneficial. As Thomas Aquinas once said, In the midst of the tyranny of the persecutors, an innumerable throng of people, both simple and learned, flocked to the Christian faith. In this faith, there are truths proclaimed that surpass every human intellect, because it teaches the exact opposite of what man naturally believes. It is a message where the pleasures of the flesh are curved. It is taught that the things of the world should be spurned. Now for the minds of mortal men to assent to these things at all is the greatest of miracles. But this wonderful conversion of the world to the Christian faith is the clearest witness that something divine was at the source of it. For it would be truly more wonderful than all miracles if the world had been led by simple and humble men to believe such lofty truths accomplish such difficult actions and to have such high hopes, much less for it to have all been based on a lie. Reason number four, what was their motive for this supposed lie anyway? I mean, can you think of a rational one? Lies are always told for some kind of selfish advantage. But what advantage came from this lie? I'll tell you the advantage they got. They were hated scorned, persecuted, excommunicated, imprisoned, tortured, exiled, crucified, even boiled alive, roasted, beheaded, sometimes dismembered, fed to the lions. Not exactly a bonus package. Reason number five, if the resurrection really was a lie, the religious leaders of the day would have produced a corpse in a heartbeat to squelch the rumors and nip this feared superstition that was literally wreaking havoc in their synagogues. And they would have nipped it in the bud. All they would have had to do was to walk over to the tomb and, and produce the body that was inside. And the Roman soldiers and the government would have gladly cooperated. So it would have been no problem at all. They, they all had great personal reasons and incentives to do so. So why didn't they? I'll tell you why. There was no body to get, which is why people who are desperate to cling to one of these theories usually claim next that the disciples must have taken the body. But if the disciples supposedly stole the corpse, we're immediately confronted with the same kind of dilemma. How in the world did they do that? The same problems Jesus would have had in taking on the military elite Green Beret of the Roman army guard, the disciples would have had. And we already showed that idea was complete nonsense. So that idea doesn't work either. Reason number six, as scripture itself says on this subject, this thing, the resurrection, was not done in a corner. It was one of the most highly visible, easily verifiable events that was happening in the Middle East at the time. Now, these biblical streets are, are quiet right now, but to suggest that this ragtag bunch of 12 disciples could have gotten away with such a, a blatant lie in the bustling streets of Jerusalem, a place that was packed with very interested third-party witnesses, 
is nothing short of absurd. As William Craig put it, the Gospels were written in such temporal and geographical proximity to the events they record that it would have been almost impossible to fabricate them. The fact that the disciples were able to proclaim the resurrection in Jerusalem in the face of their enemies a few weeks after the crucifixion shows that what they proclaimed was true, for they could have never proclaimed the resurrection and been believed under such circumstances had it not occurred. And reason number seven, if there had been a conspiracy, it would have certainly been sniffed out and exposed by the disciples' enemies, who had both the power and the desire to blow the whistle on any fraud. So, to more or less sum it all up, if the resurrection was nothing more than a lie, a conspiracy, concocted by a group of liars, well, then it violates every known law in the universe pertaining to the history and psychology of lying. In other words, it just doesn't wash. In fact, it's infinitely more unscientific and, and full of fantasy than any claim of the resurrection ever was. And unlike the resurrection, it flat out contradicts the facts. So, two down, two to go. The final two theories. First, the hallucination theory. If you were walking down the street and you thought you saw, right before your eyes, ex-president Richard Nixon standing right in front of you, talking and acting just like any other person, wouldn't you think there was a far better chance that you had seen a hallucination than that you were actually seeing correctly? I think that's a fair statement since Richard Nixon died in 1994. So then why not think the same thing about Christ's resurrection? Well, let me give you eight good reasons. Which will include the number of people who saw the resurrected Christ, the time and place the resurrected Christ was seen, the length of time the resurrected Christ was seen, the number of times the resurrected Christ was seen, the interaction with the resurrected Christ, as well as the empty tomb. This particular theory, sadly, has become the staple, the standard line of liberal theology departments in many of our colleges, universities, and even seminaries today. And frankly, it's a pitiful theory. So it just goes to show you how far bad information can go if you don't check the facts for yourself. Because you even have college theology professors perpetrating these silly theories in many places today, simply because they too haven't bothered to check the facts. By the way, I've got a bit of a dilemma here. Namely, I've got more information than I do the time to share it. So I'm gonna have to do this. I'm gonna have to refer you to three of our programs that more than adequately bury the myth theory forever. Each of the program titles appear on the screen right now. And if you feel you still need additional information to double check the facts that we're discussing here, after you watch the next section of this program, well, just call the number on the screen and tell the person who answers that you want to acquire the three tapes that were being offered. And we'll be happy to send you copies because each one of those programs is packed with factual evidence that confirms the textual integrity and the historical accuracy of Scripture. But for now, let me address this supposed challenge to the resurrection of Jesus Christ as follows. For starters, the whole idea behind the myth theory is that the stories of the Bible we're being told are not meant to be taken literally. So we're told by liberal college professors and pastors and teachers that the biblical stories are meant to be taken just spiritually or symbolically. So we can each glean our own little perspective on it. Well, that may be great, but the only problem is the Bible itself makes the emphatic assertion that it is not at all a book of fables or clever stories. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Or as the King James Version puts it, 
For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So, for the Bible itself to explicitly and expressly state in so many words that the information in the Bible is not at all supposed to be taken as a myth, well, it makes the contention that it is a myth a direct challenge that is either a lie itself or it makes the Bible a lie. The dilemma is unavoidable. The events of the Bible are either categorically true or they are a pathetic pack of lies. The writers of Scripture are either divinely inspired writers of God's own word or a bunch of malicious deceivers. Jesus is either God in the flesh or he was a liar and a raging lunatic. And if it's all a lie, well, go back to square one, arguing hallucination or conspiracy arguments that have already been completely refuted. There's simply no escaping from the horns of the dilemma. I mean, I suppose liberal theologians and academics are free to throw their wild, illogical, non-factual, and very unsupportable ideas and theories out there if they want to. It's a free country. And I suppose, unfortunately, there are no laws against using their command of the English language and their tremendous academic credentials to make naive people who don't check the facts for themselves believe these things. But as I've contended all along, anyone who just simply checks the facts for themselves can quickly realize for themselves that there is no theory that fits the facts of the resurrection save the traditional biblical Christian explanation that an actual bodily resurrection took place by the divine authority and power of God. And ironically, the, the whole point and the whole purpose of the resurrection in the first place was that it was divinely orchestrated by God to save people and to bring them to heaven and to confirm the very facts that we're debating here. In other words, People are not naturally prone to believe the miraculous and supernatural. So God even went so far as to spell it out for us with a historical, provable, tangible event. Yet people still try to avoid the issue. They argue in circles that they don't believe a miraculous event occurred because they don't believe in miraculous events. Because they don't believe a miraculous event occurred. And on and on. The other thing I'd like to quickly point out about the myth theory with the limited time that we still have left is this. You've got people running around today making claims that Jesus is great, that there's profound wisdom and truth in the Bible, because who can deny it, really? And yet, out of the other side of their mouths, they won't acknowledge or accept the actual claims that Jesus made. In other words, they say they think Jesus is wonderful, a good man, a, a great teacher, not God, not a, a resurrected Christ, but an incredibly wise and moral person. So they make all kinds of flattering and complimentary statements like these. Jesus was a great teacher, a very ethical, moral human being, perhaps in our opinion not a, not a prophet, but certainly a phenomenal teacher and Christianity is a great world religion. I believe in Jesus, like Buddha, like the Dalai Lama, like Gandhi, like Martin Luther King Jr., like anybody who's ever put their trust in humanity before themselves. And as a public icon, I believe in the truth of Christ, but I'd be pretty hard-pressed to buy the whole immaculate conception rising and coming back down routine. But how do you explain the different beliefs that Christ thought it was uh, Judaism or his form of Judaism? There was a really but, Muhammad thought it was another route. He thinks it's another route. He believes he's up but there. But see, Larry, I think I don't think Christ was a Christian. I don't think Buddha was a Buddhist, and I don't think Muhammad was a Mohammedan. These are ideologies and dogmas that came for political reasons Give afterwards. Yeah. Afterwards, these yeah, Christ were Christ never formed a religion. No, he, he was he channeled the absolute through himself. Now, of course, all of those appear on the surface to be very noble and complimentary statements about Jesus. But what those people fail to realize is that when they make such statements, they're actually making fools of themselves. They're revealing the fact that they don't know the first thing about what Jesus said, what he claimed or 
or what has been confirmed that he actually did. Because if they did, they would quickly realize that Jesus himself claimed to be God. They would realize that his, his whole life, his whole purpose and death and resurrection testified to that truth. So to suggest that he, he wasn't those things and yet to still admire and respect him in his teachings means either they admire and respect a bold-faced liar and or a raging lunatic who, who suffers from some psychotic divinity complex or they have absolutely no idea what in the world they're even talking about. So what you have is people making absurd and self-created claims that there was some man in history named Jesus who was not God, did not claim to be God, performed no miracles, and did not actually rise from the dead bodily. And simultaneously those same people make claims stating that Jesus was somehow still a good man and a wise teacher. Well, the only problem is there is not one single shred of evidence of any kind that such a man like that ever actually existed in history or in mythology. In fact, the only historical record that does meet empirical standards of evidence and that does match the archaeological record and that does fit the claims of Christ and his disciples is that Jesus was in fact God. And that he did in fact claim to be God. And that he did perform countless miracles. And yes, that he did in fact rise from the dead. But the point is, you can't have it both ways. Either Jesus is who he claimed to be, or he's an immoral crazy man. He's either God, like you said, or he's a liar and a lunatic. So all I can tell you is this, the facts that point towards verifying Jesus' own claims to be God and that verify his actual physical resurrection so overwhelmingly outweigh the alternative explanations that it can be fairly stated that the real believers and perpetrators of myths and blind faith are not those who have taken the time to discover the easily verifiable facts of biblical Christianity, but instead those who have decided it's easier to believe the frighteningly uneducated opinions of the likes of a Sharon Stone or a Shirley MacLaine. Now, the facts are clear. No satisfactory evidence to refute a real resurrection has ever been presented. And, conversely, the evidence of the genuine bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is undeniable. This isn't a matter of blind faith or naive foolish people believing a pipe dream. Which is why some of the greatest intellectual minds in history have tested the facts and have come away with the same inevitable conclusion. The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is an undeniable fact of history. So ask yourself the question, if you dare, why? Why don't you believe? And I think that when and if you truly and sincerely look past the surface and the superficial, and you finally, for the first time, look deep down inside your own heart, you'll find the same answer that, that all men who have been honest with themselves throughout the course of history have found. And it was a sudden, cold realization that if, if Jesus did rise from the dead, then He is God. If He's God, you and I must forsake our sins, the sins we might even love, which include our, our sinful desires to be our own gods, to be our own arbiters of truth and of right and wrong. And we must instead turn to Him and bow down our lives before Him, humble heartfelt obedience and submission. And that, my friends, is the real issue, isn't it? This isn't so much about the head. The facts are undeniable. The real issue is accepting and submitting to these truths in our hearts and in our lives. Which leads me to our final point. 
I spend a lot of time in this program talking to your mind. So may God bless my words as I now speak to your heart as well. Eye to eye, heart to heart, based on fact, not on personal opinion, based on truth, not man-made religion. Let me tell you from the bottom of my heart, it's vital you know. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is a bedrock, fundamental truth to any right relationship with God. And make no mistake about it, where you land on this issue will be instrumental in determining your faith. Life eternal and life abundant weigh in the balance. If the event of the bodily resurrection was untrue, well then the hope of millions and millions of people, both today and throughout history, would be absolutely in vain. If the resurrection and the other events as recorded in Scripture are false, well then the entire Christian faith is, is nothing but blind hope. And Christians, as the Apostle Paul wrote, are truly to be pitied more than any other men in the world. Because our lives as Christians are sacrificially lived out in light of that truth. Now, as the Apostle Paul wrote, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. But He did not raise Him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Fortunately, as we have briefly but undeniably shown in this program, Paul's next words are also true. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And to our comfort and to our immense joy, the faith of the Christian in that historical event of the resurrection can be anchored in factual, empirical, undeniable evidence. Lord Lyndhurst, who is universally recognized as one of the greatest legal minds in British history, put it this way. I know pretty well what evidence is, and I tell you, such evidence as that for the resurrection has never broken down yet. That is the statement of a man who was one of the most skilled men in legal history in the assessment of factual and empirical data. And the reason such a brilliant analytical and legal mind was able to make that statement is because the factual evidence of the resurrection is overwhelming in content, in substance, in volume, and in scope. So again, I have to ask you, why? Have you ever challenged yourself on the reason why you've been willing to settle for theories that have literally no possibility whatsoever of being true? Or what has caused you to avoid the issue or remove the reality of the resurrection from your life? In any way, how have you gained from that strategy? How has it benefited you? Other than to perhaps enjoy certain sins for a season, sins that will bring certain judgment on your life and that even in this life have cost you dearly. Have you somehow gained by not having a close, intimate, thrilling relationship with the very God that has created you? Do you enjoy being distant from Him and unable to experience Him? Capable of only speculating that such experiences of God are, are impossible? Let's face it, if you've bought into the story that the Bible is a myth, and that the resurrection is untrue, that Jesus is just a, a good, wise man, but not God, then you've been scammed, lied to. You've become another potential victim of our very immoral and very secular society and the very educational system that secular humanists, who by definition are agnostics or atheists, have put into place. So in other words, 
you're listening to the most immoral, godless men in society to get your advice and your information about God. And perhaps the biggest irony of all is that one of the primary purposes of the resurrection itself was to prove that Jesus' claims and Holy Scripture are divinely true. So to disbelieve it, you, you actually have to ignore the massive evidence in favor of it and deliberately make an exception to the rules that you would use everywhere else in determining truth. Listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. Demons are real. They're not mental aberrations. They're living, breathing entities. And hell is real. It's not a, a mythological story made up by religious fundamentalists. It's an actual place. A place of punishment. Eternal punishment. Folks, that word eternal means forever. And the degree and intensity of the pain that will take place there will be unbearable. The guilt and, and remorse will be horrifying. So you have a, a real hell made up of real demons who hate us, which is why it's not hard to imagine that their goal, their objective, if you will, is to keep people confused and to keep them in the dark about the truths that God has recorded in the Bible. Truth that state that we can be delivered from all of that. Truth that state that we need all of us to be delivered from all of that. Because the Bible teaches that we, each and every one of us, have all fallen short of the standard that God has set for us. We have all sinned against the just and holy God. And that leaves us with only one alternative. If we ever expect to see heaven, we need to take His plan of mercy on His term, not on ours. You've got your own religion? Well, that's great, but get rid of it. You've got your own ideas and opinions and beliefs? Well, fine, we all do. But insofar as they don't line up with Scripture, throw them out. Because apart from the truth, they're worthless. In fact, they're worse than worthless. They'll keep you in the dark and keep you complacent. And in the end, they will cost you an eternity in hell. And I realize that's very politically incorrect to say these days. But frankly, I'm not that concerned because this is heaven and hell we're talking about right now. Not being politically correct. And what are you afraid of anyway? I mean, what terrible fate awaits you if you follow the huge and comprehensive trail of evidence that naturally arises from the data as we've shown in this program? What? Are you afraid you, you might have a beautiful, restored relationship with Almighty God? Do you fear obedience to the most wise and kind and loving Savior who ever lived, Jesus Christ? Are you afraid that a life of self-denial and detachment from the world, both of which, self and the world, have, have brought you sufficient pain and heartache to last ten lifetimes? Are you, are you fearful of a life of righteousness and holiness and purity? which really is the only life that can bring true happiness in this life and in the next? Oh, are you afraid those things will be too much of a blessing? What then? What reason is left? What reason can possibly be left to continue to reject or ignore the truth? Let me tell you something, my friends. Demons hate us. And they fear Jesus Christ because his words are true. He said, quote, I give you power over the demons. They are in subjection to you in my name. Do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you, Jesus said. Rejoice that your names have been recorded in heaven. And all who believe can rejoice because that's the real blessing and bottom line of believing in the truth. Heaven awaits infinite blessing in the very presence of Almighty God. I'm here to tell you the good news. But don't believe the, the liberal interpreters of the Bible because the message that flashed across the ancient world and that set hearts on fire and that changed lives from sinners to saints and that literally turned the world upside down was not merely love your neighbor. Every morally sane person already knew that. Now the news, the good news, 
that he's alive. Jesus, the man that claimed to be God, proved that he was God by raising himself from the dead. So that means every single promise recorded in the Bible is categorically true. The disciples and apostles worshiped Jesus as God. And then they went out from Pentecost and preached the gospel to everyone that would listen all over the world because they had seen the risen Savior. I'm standing on this spot with this television camera rolling over 2,000 years later, never having physically seen him, never having physically touched him because he is still alive. Because that same good news came down to me and to millions of people like me. And we have found out he is just as real and just as ready to change lives today as he was in the Apostles' day. Every time he reaches down from heaven, he changes a, a pathetic human heart and life like mine. He takes its natural sinful desires and converts them to, to holy, pure desires. Every time he he saves and redeems a drug addict or a, or a prostitute or a, even a person who self-righteously used to see themselves as more. He recreates out of the ashes of our sin the glory and the immortality and the eternal life that is the gift of God. We see firsthand the words of Christ when he said, I live, I live, I live. Buddha is dead. Krishna is dead. Muhammad is dead. The, philosophers and sages of this world are all dead but of Jesus Christ in Jesus alone it can be said because I live you shall also live in Jesus Christ Almighty God the living and resurrected King of creation bless that truth to your soul clearly shows Jesus of Nazareth was brutally and self-sacrificially crucified and then three days later he gloriously rose from the dead which irrefutably makes his claim to be God also true the only question that remains is what are you going to do with that information many people superficially and intellectually assent to it in other words since the facts are evident, or since they were raised in a religion that teaches it, they accept the facts about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection as true, in their minds at least. But that is not enough. In order to see heaven, Jesus Christ himself states, you must be born again. That's what John chapter 3 states. Jesus is trying to teach us that a radical transformation must take place in your heart and in your life. It is the Bible, Holy Scripture, that teaches the details of how and why that is true. So, if you are not born again, and based on what you've just heard and seen for yourself, please, for the sake of your own soul, find a Bible, search out its pages, cry out to God in Jesus' name until you are born again. For there is a promise recorded in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13 which reads, You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And sooner or later, every
every knee will bow to Jesus as Lord. But only those who willingly choose Christ now in this life will reap the benefits of heaven and avoid the consequences of eternal hell. So may all who have ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the church.